Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let you know, me just say this. Oh, from that is from so the way good, I huh? saw you guys participating in that song, <laughs> some of you need a miracle. <laughs> and he is still the God of miracles. Don't you give up. Absolutely. Even when you don't see it, he's working. Absolutely. And you can have is. peace knowing that, mm -hmm. that he is working. I see him. I see him. Praise the Lord. I love that line in the song. Uh, even though I, even when I don't see it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. That is just such a tremendous statement of faith because, you know, I, I've heard before, uh, sometime back when I was growing up, you know, if you can't if you can't smile by feeling, smile by faith. You know. And I, I've always remembered that, you know, that if you can't smile because you feel like smiling, smile because you have faith that that's going to be a great thing in your life. It's going to matter. And, and to that, I just kind of changed the word up a little bit. You know, if you, can't, if you can't sing by feeling, sing by faith. If you can't believe by feeling, believe by faith. And, you know, if you can't, if you, if you can't praise by, by that sense of desire and you praise by faith that... God says if you do, it's going to matter and it's going to make a tremendous difference in your life because God has a power to give to us that oftentimes doesn't make sense in our current mind. The, the peace of God, those of you that have the outlines for today, you see we're talking about the peace of God and I, I want to just share with you for a few minutes about the power of the peace of God because God's peace is profound in our life especially in these days that we're living in today. We're living in some of the most unsettled, anxiety-producing, uh, frightening, fearful days of our entire existence. And, and, and I know that you're thinking nationally. You know, you're thinking, yeah, Iran's a problem and Iraq is a problem and Syria's a problem and North Korea's a problem, Russia's a problem, China's a problem. Uh, we have problems with terrorism and threats and nuclear weapons. I mean, you know, they're just big things that are just fearful and anxiety producing. But man, what about those things with your family? I mean, how, how is your family doing? What, what are the kids doing at school? How, how, are they, how are they making it? Are they being bullied on social media? Are they, are they being lured by some pervert on some website somewhere? Are they, are they being taken advantage of in some way? And I mean, what about your job? Is it going to keep going and you're going to have enough money to do the things that you want to do and you're concerned about that and where you live and those crazy neighbors that move in and who's going to take care? I mean, there are all kinds of fearful, anxiety-producing things in life that we face nowadays. And I'm just telling you that God has made a provision for that and, and, it, is, and it is his peace that he gives to us that is the most powerful weapon in God's arsenal. I'm, I'm serious about it, I and I hope to show you a little bit about it today and a little bit about it next week, and, and we can see what I'm talking about because God is just, this is a tremendously powerful tool in the arsenal of God to fight the enemy, and the enemy knows it. Satan knows this. And so Satan's intention is, if you have peace, he wants to take it from you. And if you don't have peace, he wants to make sure that you don't find it. And Jesus, speaking about in, in, to his disciples right before he left the earth, he's telling them, look, guys, I've got some, I'm going away, but don't be fearful because uh, there are going to be great things that I'm going to leave you with and great things that are going to come through the Holy Spirit. And, and, and so don't be afraid, but I need to tell you about these things. And then they looked at him and they said, well, Lord, when are these things going to be? And how are we going to recognize when, when these things come? And when are you going to return? And is there anything that we can, can know that will give us some encouragement before you return that... You're actually, you know, those are actually close to the times where you're going to return. And then in Luke 21, and, and this is in several places in the gospel, guys. I just chose Luke 21. But I want you to see what Jesus said to them. Because in Luke 21, Jesus gets pretty specific about the days before his return. And so look at what he says. And there will be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. 
and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Now, let me, let me just ask you something. Uh, are we seeing on the earth today distress of nations? I would say at, uh, more distress than we've ever seen. I mean, every nation of the earth seems to be distressed. They got a pandemic almost going over on in China. I mean, North Carolina can't get, I mean, North, North Carolina, North Korea can't get its act together. Um, we seem to have conflict uh, within countries, and, and of course, the Middle East is always a powder keg. I mean, they're just distress among nations everywhere. But do you notice the word that he adds to that? With perplexity. With perplexity means there's no answer. And are there any answers to the distress of nations that we have in the world today? No. You can get in there and do anything you want and try to fix things and straighten things out, and it's still a distressful mess. And then he says that the sea and the waves are roaring. The sea, uh, you may not be familiar with this, the sea is a term, an analogy term that is often used to describe the masses of people on the earth, like a giant sea of people. And notice what it says, that, that all of the, the, the sea of people on the earth are unsettled. It, it's like waves roaring. So we have this massive, unsettled um, group of people on the earth. And so we're, uh, you know, if you're saying, Jesus... Where are you? Uh, when are you? When are you? When are you going to be? When, you, when is your return? Well, you, we would say, well, these uh, there is certainly distress of nations, and there certainly is no answer, and the masses are certainly uh, uh, unrest. I mean, there is no there's no rest and no peace on the earth. Notice verse twenty six. Jesus predicts terrorism on this earth, men's hearts failing them from fear. That word fear is the word phobos which can better be in translated terror. Jesus said, before I come back, there's going to be terror on this earth. And men's hearts are going to be failing them. They're going to be so frightened of this terror that is happening on earth. But notice, he didn't just say about the terror. He added this line to it. Uh, and, the, and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. In other words, he says, and, and this is really true, and we know this, you know, the bad thing about, terrible thing about terrorism is not just what, what they do right now, right? I mean, what they do right now in terroristic things, they blow up something or they kill people or, or they run automobiles through or they have bombs or what. But, I mean, there are all kinds of ways that terrorists strike and, and try to make us feel terror, you know, terror and, and scare us in life. But the real problem with terror is not necessarily what they're doing now, but what they plan to do. What are they going to do? What is the, what's going to happen? Am I going to be in the right place at the wrong time or the wrong place at the wrong time? Or what? I mean, men's hearts are going to be failing them. And, and as I mentioned, you know, not only big national stuff, but I mean, in your own life, all kinds of uh, things that are causing us to be frightened as dads, as moms, with our family, with our children and you know, we, we, we put them out every day and we hope they'll be safe and we pray for them to be safe and we, we can't let them go out the front door and play in the front yard. Somebody might come along and grab them. I mean, we, it, it, it's a fearful, frightening, terribly distressful, perplexing world that we're living in now. And Jesus said, this is how it was going to be before he returns, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Now, what I want you to notice about that is what Jesus said. Jesus says, now, when you see all of these things beginning to happen that I've just described to you, all of this distress, all of this lack of peace, all of this uh, terrorism and all of the, the, the fear and all of that that's being perpetrated on the earth. He says, don't, don't look down at the earth and, and, and look at the, at the problems and focus on the problems because if you, if you focus on the problems, it, it, you're not going to have any peace in your life. But he said, what, what you need to do is when you see all these problems, he said, look up and lift up your heads 
In other words, look, take another focus and lift your, well, it kind of sounds funny, lift your eyes to the skies. Uh, <laughs> that's kind of a poetic bounce, but, but it's, it sounds a little silly. But, but uh, you lift your eyes to the skies because Jesus said, that's where your answer is. And if, and, and if you'll put your focus on me, uh, I can give you some peace in life. Because listen, it does matter where you focus in life. If you focus on your problems and the giants and the issues and the troubles and the anxieties and the fears and the strife of life, guess what? You're not going to have peace. If you focus on, the Lord said, focus on me and focus on what I can do and focus on how I love you and what I have for you and how I can bless you and, 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 and how I know what's going on and I know what you need and I know what your purpose and I'm ready to meet that need, focus on that and you can have peace in this life. And isn't that what people are looking for all over the world? The peace of God? I mean, the peace in their life, they, all kinds of addictions in this world today, right? People are sexually addicted, gambling addicted, adrenaline junkies, uh, uh, drugs, alcohol, uh, you name it. They're addicted to almost everything. And what is that? Many times, most of the time, it's a cry out from within the human soul for peace, some kind of even momentary uh, peace and calm and security in life. Well, God says, I've got peace for you. I've got eternal peace, and I've got peace for you right now. And I'm just telling you that according to what Jesus said, peace is a birthright to those of us who know the Lord. Yeah. In John 14, my favorite passage, <laughs> some people ask me, what is your favorite passage of Scripture? I say, whichever one I'm on right now. You know? <laughs> but this one really is my favorite because I love what it says. John 14, in the first few verses, Jesus is talking to his disciples about the fact that he's going away, but he's not going to leave them comfortless. By the way, one of the great fears in humanity is, is an, orphan. And, you know, an orphan many times without a mom and dad has the feeling deep within them that somehow they have to provide for themselves and they're on their own and they've got to take care of themselves and they've got to struggle to do that. Well, the devil uses that that sense of abandonment and that orphan nature. And God knew that. And so God, so Jesus, before he left the earth, he said, now listen, I'm going to tell you something. I'm leaving you, but you're not, I'm not going to leave you orphans. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit and he's going to take care of you. And he's just like me. So don't be, don't be fearful and don't feel like an orphan. You're not by yourself. Or you're not alone. You don't have to do it yourself. And he starts it by saying in verse one, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and if it weren't so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you, that where I am there you might be also. And, 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 and he's just comforting along like that. And then in verse 27, he, he comes back and he says to him this, this really significant passage. Look at what he says. Peace I leave with you. In other words, I'm going away and I'm going to leave peace with you. And that peace is going to be for you until I come back again. So from the time I leave this earth until the time I come back again, you have the opportunity to have something special from me, and that is peace I leave with you. Look at the next line. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. And then he just gives them a little instruction about him rejoicing because the Father's greater. But, but what I want you to see is what Jesus said to us. Jesus said, I'm going away and what I'm going to leave you with is my peace. And my peace is not like the world's peace. Mine is a different kind of peace, and I'm, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm leaving it to you. So from the time he leaves until the time he returns, he gives us his peace, and his peace is going to be different from the world's peace. What is the peace of Jesus? Well, the peace of Jesus is, is an abiding, internal, and this is a kind of a big hyphenated word, but it, you'll understand, trans-circumstantial, which means the circumstances of my life don't have anything to do with this peace. It is internal. It's on the inside of me. It abides with me. It stays with me. 
it hooks on to me. And it doesn't matter what kind of circumstances I face in life, I have a calmness and a security because Jesus has attached himself to my life. As opposed to the world's type of peace, the world's type of peace is a, is a fragile, circumstantial, uh, elusive kind of peace that is uh, hard to get and easy to lose. So Jesus said, look, I'm going to give you my peace and and you can have it, and it's going to be powerful for you. Because we're not designed to live without peace. God designed us, we humans, to live in an environment of peace. When we don't have an environment of peace in, the life, in our life, it does all kinds of terrible physical things to us. Did you know that in America, the number one cause for doctor's office visits is stress? And the number one cause of prescription medications in America is stress and, and anxiety. And God didn't design us to live in an atmosphere and to live under stress and anxiety. We are designed by God to live in peace. And in order to recharge yourself, and I know you've experienced this, but in order to recharge yourself, I know sometimes we get frazzled and we get bent out of shape and we get everything but peaceful. And in order to, to regain ourselves, in order to get, to get back into life again, it takes two things. It takes order. You can't, you, you can't recharge in this helter-skelter, hustle-bustle, clutter, noise environment of life. There has to be order and there has to be peace. So God designed us to live that way. So what is it, the importance of the peace of God in our life? I give, I'm going to give you four things today, and then, and then we'll look at how to have it next week. But let's look at these four things today. What is the importance of peace? God says, I've got it for you. You can have it. I'm going away. And, and as long as I'm gone, until I come back, you're going to have my peace. How important is that? Well, number one, what does it do for us? Peace is how God guides us. And I'm going to talk to you about something that is about your feelings, all right, very quickly here. In the book of Colossians, the Apostle Paul says this, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which also you were called in one body and be thankful. Paul is telling us that God created us to be one body and to live in peace. And that we are, allowed, we are to allow the peace of God to rule in our hearts. The word rule is the, is the, is the Greek word brabeus. Brabeus means to act as umpire. Paul is saying, let the peace of God act as an umpire in your life. Now, those of you that are athletes or you've had children or grandchildren that are athletes, you've encountered umpires and referees all your life, right? What does an umpire do in a, in a, in a baseball game or a referee in a basketball game or football game? Well, they enforce the rules, right? Any, in any situation in the game where something happens, the umpire is there to say, that's illegal or that's out of bounds or incomplete or no goal. I mean, in other words, in every situation that happens in the game, what an umpire does is an umpire makes a, a, a situational guidance of the game. So now, 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 now this is, remember, this is what Jesus is saying, and I, and I want you to get it. And let the peace of God give you situational guidance in your life. Why do we need situational guidance from the Holy Spirit? Because most of the decisions we make in life are not decisions between good and evil, but are decisions between better and best. Those decisions are not talked about in the, in the Word of God specifically. There are many more decisions in our life that are not talked about in the Word of God than there are those that are clearly outlined in the Word of God. Now, let me just say this to you. If God's Word says don't do it, then that's not a situational decision. You don't do it. 
If God's word says, you do this, that's not a situational decision. That is, you do it, the word says it. I'm talking about all those decisions that the word of God says nothing about. Big decisions in life, like, who am I going to marry? Should I marry that one or should I marry that one? Where am I going to live? Is that the house that God would have me to live in? Is this the street God wants me to live on? And what about my career? What kind of job should I seek for? Or where should I go to college? Or what is my major? All of these are decisions the Bible says nothing about in life. And God says, look, on these kind of decisions, what we must do is you must let the peace of God make those situational calls in your hearts so that you can have peace because God knows everything about your life. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. And God knows what is going to be best and more, most peaceful and calm for you in life. And so God says, let, let me make the call. So I, I'm saying one of the important powers of the peace of God is that God uses his peace to guide our life. Now, let me, let me call attention to something in the Old Testament that you may not have ever even uh, heard about before in life. This is, there is in, in the breastplate of the high priest, it sits right here on his chest, right over his heart, because the children of Israel are always close to God's heart, and that means you're always close to God's heart. And then on the back side of that high priest breastplate, there's a little pouch, and in that little pouch, there, is, there are two two instruments there. They're called the Urim and the Thummim. Now, have any of you ever heard of that before? The Urim and the Thummim. Well, what it was used for, it was used by the high priest to determine God's will and God's direction for the nation of Israel. And what would happen is when the high priest would come into the presence of the Lord, he would pray about God's direction for the nation of Israel. And when he would pray, he would say, God, do, do, do you want us to fight the Philistines or should we go the way of the Amalekites? Or where do we, do we stop here or do we keep moving forward? Do we go left? Do we go right? And the high priest is searching for the direction of God for his people. And it is said that the Urim and the Thummim that is on a pouch right over the heart of the high priest would begin to move. And would begin one, the Urim means light and Thummim means uh, uh, preparation or direction. So uh, this was God's perfect direction for Israel. That's what they represented. And, and they would actually physically move or, or have some type of action that would tell the high priest, this is what God's will is. And I'm just, I'm just using that to say that that God has used before with his people something that was tangible, that they could feel, that it wasn't, it wasn't uh, uh, subjective, it's not some uh, cosmic pie in the sky, that it's actually something that is real and objective and, and, that you can, and that you can sense and you can feel in your life. And I can just tell you that Tanya and I have made hundreds of decisions in our life based on whether we had God's peace or not clearly on God's peace. And we've prayed and asked the Lord many, in many decisions of life, God, what would you have us to do? And then we would line out something that would be, you know, Lord, how much should we give to this project? How do we need to, do we need to be concerned about this? And, or which direction do we go? And we're, and we're just laying that before the Lord because there's no clear direction. The Bible doesn't print that on the pages somewhere in there and say, thou shalt go to there and thou shalt. We just need to know what God would have for our life and we pray it. And let me tell you how this has to work. You got to depend on each other. You can't bully each other. And if both of you don't agree on it, you don't do it. I mean, it's not something where I look at Tanya and I say, Lord, do we do this? And she said, I said, do you have any peace about this? And she said, well, no, I don't. And then I say, well, my, come on, baby. He's got to have some peace about it. Yeah. I mean, it's not where you try to argue somebody into having peace. It's just, it, it is, it's a decision that God will in your heart, give you peace about that decision or, or you won't have peace about that decision. And it's just, and it's tangible and, it, and you can feel it and you can sense it and it's there. So 
What's important about the peace of God? Well, God uses the peace, his peace to guide us. Secondly, peace is how God protects our mind and heart against Satan's attack of fear and anxiety. Uh, let me give you Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Paul says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Guard is phoreo. And phoreo means to put, like, to put a military guard to prevent a hostile invasion. So God is saying, Here, I'm going to put, I'm going to put a military guard to stop a hostile invasion. And what that's going to be is, it's going to be, it's going to be my peace. And that peace is going to stop the enemy from invading into your life. And notice what he says. It's what he starts with. Be anxious for nothing. I've always thought that anxiety was a condition. As a matter of fact, I've been given medicine before for anxiety. Have any of you? Yeah. Ativan and Xanax and all that. That's all anti-anxiety medicines. And people, are, people think they have a condition. But according to this, he tells us, this is a command, be anxious for nothing. And I'm just saying that, that anxiety is not a condition. Anxiety is a choice. Or else the Bible wouldn't tell us not to do it. Do you think God would look at us and tell us, don't do this if we didn't have any choice about it? Certainly, yeah. So he says, be anxious. Look, look don't, don't make this choice. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made to, known to God. And when you do it like that, the peace of God is going to guard your heart and minds through Christ Jesus. The peace of God that passes all understanding. What does that mean? It means you shouldn't have peace. It means everybody else doesn't have peace. Everybody else is all upset about it. And given the conditions and the circumstances that you're in, you ought to be all upset about it too. But somehow you're not. Somehow you, you're at peace. Why are you at peace? That doesn't make any sense. We can't understand that. A peace that passes understanding. And that's going to keep your heart military guarded against a hostile invasion so that the enemy can't come in and put fear and anxiety on you because the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guards your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Why is there so much peace? Well, there's so much peace because obviously God builds a fortress around your heart and mind that the devil can't penetrate, that the devil can't act through. And it actually protects you from the enemy coming in and destroying your, your peace in your life and filling you with anxiety and fear. Here's the third thing. Peace is the platform of our witness. Uh, do you, you guys are aware that God calls us to be witnesses on this earth, right? When I say a witness, do you know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about we have a job. We have a job to spread the gospel. We have a job to influence our friends to try to win them to faith in Christ or strangers. I mean, our job is to present Jesus Christ in such a way that people in this world would want Jesus Christ and would, and, and would pray and ask Jesus Christ to come into their life and save their soul and they would surrender to Christ. Now, in the, in the book of Ephesians, in chapter 6, you have a, 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 a listing of the armor of God. And the armor of God, I'm just going to read the, the verses, and it's not, this is not the, all the armor, but, but I want to get down to a certain point, and, and you can see, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The word wiles is methodia in Greek, which means the methods. That just means Satan has a strategy. Satan is not, Satan is not playing haphazard. It's not, he, he has a method he's going after you with. So you put on the whole armor of God because Satan, Satan's plan is to destroy you, so to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We need to remember that when we get mad at people in our life. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness and 
heavenly places. Therefore, take the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, I want to stop just right there because what that says is that we are to, the shoes that we wear on our feet are the peace of God, which is the gospel that we preach. What, what is our gospel about? The gospel that we preach is about the peace of God. It, it's about reconciliation, right? It's about making peace between God and man, right? That's Our gospel is, come and let us show you how you can be at peace with God and how you and God can be joined together and reconciled even though you're a sinner and he is holy. So our gospel is a gospel of peace. And I'm just saying, I, I'm just saying to you that what God has for us is that God wants us to carry the gospel of peace so that when people do not have peace in their life, they would see the peace in our life, they would be attracted to the peace that we have in our life, and then we would have an opportunity to share how to have that peace so that they can come to the Lord and their life can be changed. Because peace is so attractive to people, right? People notice it when you have peace. And so God says, look, what peace is important in your life because peace gives you the opportunity to draw people to yourself because people are looking for peace in drugs. They're looking for peace in relationships. They're looking for peace in popularity. They're looking for peace in money. Uh, they're looking for just moments of peace any way they can have it. And we have it in our hearts and in our lives and it's free and we can tell them how to have peace in our life, in their lives. In the book of Acts, Chapter 2, the disciples get filled with the Holy Spirit. And when they get filled with the Holy Spirit, they begin to act so free. Before this, they're scared to death. They're frightened of everything. Jesus comes through the wall, and they, you know, they're scared to death. He said, oh, guys, oh, peace, peace, man. It's me. It's just me. Yeah. I mean, they're scared. They're trembling. They got the doors locked and shut it and barred and, and everything else. And, 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 uh, and, and he comes through the wall. But the point is, once the Holy Spirit fills their life, if you read Acts chapter 2, it, it reads just like this. Once the Holy Spirit comes in and fills them, they go out of the room, and they hit the streets, and they're just thousands and thousands of people on the street down there and they just begin stopping on the street corner and begin talking to this group about Jesus and this group about Jesus and this group about Jesus. I mean, they're not afraid of anything. They have such tremendous peace in their life that the apostle Peter has to come out and stand on the steps and preach a message to the, to the citizens of Jerusalem and said, look, these guys, I know you think they're drunk because, I mean, they're just so loose now. They're not afraid of anything. They got so much peace in their life that they're not, I mean, they're just going wild. And they're not drunk like you think. This is that Holy Spirit. I mean, and he explains to them, and 3,000 people get saved that day. I'm just saying to you that that God intends for our life and our ministry to be a ministry of peace, and peace gets attractive, and we get concerned about others when we have peace. Let me give you just this last one real quick. This is the fourth reason. It's the purpose for our ministry and our influence. All right, God gives us guidance through, the, through peace. Uh, peace protects our heart and mind from anxiety and fear. Peace is the platform that we witness from, and then God gives us uh, our ministry and our purpose is to bring peace and to influence others with peace. In, in other words, when you're around people, they ought, to, they ought to be at peace. And that God intends for you to be a powerful tool to bring peace. Let me just show you. Here's one. Here's the beatitude that says that. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Now, notice that that doesn't say blessed are the peace lovers, because we all love peace. We all want peace. It doesn't uh, say blessed are the peace wishers. It says blessed are the peace makers. Blessed are the people who actively seek to make peace in life. Now, I'm going to tell you, if you've ever been a peacemaker, you can notice, you, you can remember one thing. As a peacemaker, it's easy to get your ears boxed off, right? 
because people are often that are angry or there's a hostile situation or whatever it might be, and you're in there trying to do something to help the situation, and it turns on you both ways. But that's why he said, you're going to be blessed. I'm going to bless you if you'll be a peacemaker. And then in Luke 10, now this is an unusual little scripture. This is spoken to the 70. Jesus sent, sent out 70 and sent them out to witness and sent them out to be used by the Holy Spirit to influence people's lives. And this is what he said to them when he sent them out. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. Carry neither money bag, knapsack, nor sandals, and greet no one along the road. But whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. When you walk into someone's home, the first thing you say is, peace to your home. And if a son of peace is there, somebody that will receive peace, somebody that'll welcome peace. If a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, you know what our, you know, you know what our ministry is? Our ministry is peace. We're carrying peace. Peace with God with men, peace with us with men. I mean, in the Bible, there's a greeting that's used in every situation. Paul used it, Peter used it, Jesus used it, the Bible uses it. They still use it today in Jerusalem. And in the Hebrew word, you'd recognize uh, better than, than just peace. They say shalom. You know what shalom means? Shalom means peace. So every greeting is peace. But it doesn't just mean the absence of uh, problems. It means the, the complete blessing of life. It means not only do I, do, I, do I want you not to have problems and issues in life, I want your life to be completely blessed with everything God has for you. Shalom. And Jesus said to, uh, to his guys, look, you can actually speak peace into someone else's home. And if they will receive that, then their home can be filled with peace because that's your ministry. That's your influence in life. That when you bring peace, people receive what you say. And you are influential in life. And Jesus showed, I'm finished with it. I'm going to give this, I'm finished. Oh, this is Jesus and the disciples in the boat. All right. On the same evening when evening had come, he said to them, let's cross to the other side. And when he had left the multitude, they took him along in a boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, uh, so the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern asleep on a pillow, and they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose, and he rebuked the wind. And he, wind, be still, you know. I rebuke you, or whatever words he used to rebuke the wind. He looks at the wind, and he says, are you at that again? You know, be still, settle down. And then he looks at the waves, and he says, peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Everything got peaceful. But he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? In other words, why didn't you do what I just did? And let me ask you, why couldn't the disciples do what Jesus just did? It was because the ocean that was churning and ripping and roaring and the wind that was blowing and, and just... That's how their hearts were. That sea looked just like their heart. That's why, okay? They, I mean, that looked just like them. That's what was on the inside of them. And man, look, you can't give away something you don't have. And if you don't have peace, you can't speak peace. And the disciples couldn't do what Jesus did because their heart, their environment. Listen, your, your environment will always reflect your inner nature. You go, uh, you go into somebody's home and you look at their home and you look at what, what that thing's like and that's a reflection of what they're like on the inside. If it's all cluttered and clamored and confused and dirty and, and stuff and hoarded and all of that kind of stuff, that's pretty much how their life is. 
just undone, messed up, uh, anxious, fearful, whatever it might be. Because our environment reflects our inner nature. And when Jesus stepped up on the boat, and Jesus looked at that wind and said, stop blowing. Peace. Be still. Because that reflected Jesus' heart. And I'm just saying to you that peace is a powerful tool. It's a powerful weapon. It's something that Jesus left us with so that our lives can be blessed on this earth. It's there for us to use. My peace I leave with you. My peace I leave with you. Not as the world gives, but my peace. And you can have it. Come on, ask. I wish I had time to preach the five points where you... I tell you how to get it, but we'll have to do that next week. We'll get it next week. But this is just bow your head with me for one moment, please.